This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And I want to give a special thank you to Alice Phelan, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Wired.com presents... The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 371 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing awesomely bad 80s fantasy movies. And I'm joined by three guests, all of whom are making their seventh appearance on the show. So first up, we've got Andrea Kale. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers' Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future Anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's the former script supervisor for Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and is currently a staff writer at WWE SmackDown Live. So, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me back. The next up, we've got Tom Gerenser. His short fiction appears in magazines such as Realms of Fantasy and in books such as New Voices and Science Fiction. His nonfiction book Think Like Google is out now, and his short story All Our Donkeys Were in Vain appears in the new anthology The Best of Galaxy's Edge 2015 to 2017. So, Tom, welcome to the show. It's great to be back, Dave. And also joining us today is Matthew Kressel. He's the author of the novel King of Shards. In a short story, The Last Novelist, or A Dead Lizard in the Yard, was nominated for the Napier Award and was a finalist for the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. Together with Ellen Datlow, he hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series at the KGB Bar in New York. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Dave. Okay, and so as I said, today we'll be talking about awesomely bad 80s fantasy movies. And so, obviously, the movies we're going to talk about today, they have to be fantasy, and they have to be from the 80s. And they have to be awesome in some way. <laughs> but still, they have to... I, I decided just sort of arbitrarily that they have to be below 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. And so uh, the movies that I rewatched in preparation for this panel, just to give you a sense of sort of what I think are the prototypical, awesomely bad 80s fantasy movies, are Masters of the Universe, Krull, Legend, The Beastmaster, and Highlander. And to give you an idea of movies that are too good to talk about today, we will not be talking about Dragon Slayer, The Dark Crystal, Willow, <laughs> or Excalibur, because those are all just too good to even qualify for this panel. Uh, we may be having a fight over this one. <laughs> um, and so actually, so Andrea, you have actually been uh, you know, pushing for a while for us to do a I... panel on awesomely bad 80s movies. I have. I am in my happy place talking about this. <laughs> Although, like I said, uh, we're not going to talk about Excalibur. Boy, it's going to be a bloodbath today. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love 80s, bad 80s science fiction and fantasy movies. I, um, I grew up watching them. I adore them. Um, some of the ones you just mentioned, I, I adore for their horribleness. Uh, I have an issue with one of them being called bad, but we will get to that. But, um, uh -huh. yeah, I, I, uh, I specifically, for me, I was like, the minute you said it, it was like Crawl and Beastmaster are two spectacularly terrible movies, but imminently, what? wait a minute, come on. <laughs> uh -oh. I know, I think Them we might have, fighting words. <laughs> I, I think we might have had this conversation, Matt, because you, you seem to like Crawl. All right, wait, 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 don't, don't, don't get to, uh, we'll get to Crawl in a second. But so, okay. um, but first of all, I just want to, I want to explain that the original idea for this was to do bad 80s, awesomely bad 80s fantasy and science fiction. And so I put out a call on our Facebook page asking for suggestions, and we got 84 comments, um, which made me realize that there's just way too many bad movies to do both fantasy and science fiction in one panel. Yes. So we're going to only focus on fantasy today and save science fiction maybe for some other time. Uh, and there's a little bit of like – a lot of these movies – it's not clear, you know, they don't fall neatly into fantasy or science fiction. So like Crawl and um, Master of the Universe are both arguably sort of science fantasy, but yeah. I'm going to treat them as fantasy for, for purposes of this panel. Yeah, um, I, I will agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So how about any other just general thoughts about, um, so how about Matt? What, what, were you excited? Are you excited to talk about this uh, this topic? Yeah, I mean, you know, 80s films are my, my kind of bread and butter. Um, we have uh, 
Teresa DeLucci and Prit Paul Baines live upstairs from us, so we often have uh, movie days where we just go to each other's uh, apartments and lay on the couch and you know in our pajamas and drink cocktails and watch you know, <laughs> bad bad eighties flicks. Um, so a lot of them, uh, they haven't seen. So actually we did watch crawl a couple of years ago and, and, uh, you know, it was mixed response to it, but I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, these are films for me that when I, when I saw them the first time, I, they were just pure enjoyment. Like you didn't, you know, this was, I, I was probably too young to really have a critical eye for, for like what makes a good and bad movie. And, you know, I re I rewatched the, uh, the five you suggested, uh, this week. Some of them hold up, some of them don't, but we can, we can get into that. But I, I mean, you know, for me, it's just, they're, they're just fun movies. I, I think they're not afraid to take risks. And, and that's what, that's what makes them, uh, that's what makes them beautiful in my eyes. <laughs> well, it was, it was <laughs> funny. I mean, it's a beautifully bad, right? Beautifully uh, okay, bad. Yes. Yes. Well, it was funny because watching these movies, it totally took me back to the 80s because, mm -hmm. you know, the experience of watching so many of these movies for me is because they, they were on television all the time. And yeah. so you would just be flipping through the channels and you would come across a movie and you're like, I don't know what this is, but it's fantasy. So I'm going to watch it. Yeah. Uh, but it's already halfway into the movie and then it's kind of boring. And so you fall asleep and then you wake up again and it's still going. And then toward the end, they would start showing so many commercials that you're like, I just I can't stand this anymore. I, I can't. I, and you just turn it off. Well, so that so, was my experience actually watching rewatching these because I'm like, I don't remember this scene at all. And I, I think yeah. it was probably one of those things where either it was just a different edit or like you said, like it was a commercial or I fell asleep. <laughs> I mean, so I don't think I've actually I actually saw Masters of the Universe all the way through until yesterday yeah me too yeah me either yeah so uh so it's yeah it's just a completely different experience actually being able to watch these movies from beginning to end which i don't think i'd ever done before even though i i think i'd seen crawl in bits and pieces like five times but never yeah. actually seen probably the beginning or the end and, um, and also watching it with a critical eye of what makes this so bad and boy is that list long but um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i i had the exact same um experience where I couldn't remember if I had ever see, actually seen Masters of the Universe and then I watched it again. I'm like, no, no, I have seen it. I just <laughs> blocked it because it was so terrible. Um, and also Crawl, like I completely forgotten the whole science fiction aspect of it um, until yeah. until I saw it again. I'm like, oh, wait, that's right. <laughs> Still didn't make any damn sense, but whatever. <laughs> I might have had a different experience uh, from maybe everybody except for Andrea because uh, uh, Andrea, I don't. How old are you? I, I think you, you're not too far from me in age, maybe. Probably not. <laughs> in okay. fact, it is my well, birthday. Just so everybody knows. Oh my God! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Thank you. <laughs> it's David. Awesome. It's David Rivera's birthday today too. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yeah. Yep. Mercurio D. Rivera. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I came by all of these movies honestly. Meaning that, you know, I didn't, when Dave sent me that email and was like, we want to do a review of awesomely bad science fiction movies or fantasy movies, I looked at the list and I was like, I thought you said we were going to look at bad movies. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right. but I was kind of half kidding, but I wasn't, I mean, when I was a kid, honestly, here's the problem. When you're, when you're 15 years old in the mid eighties and you're watching these movies, you can't think of them as bad because you're like, there's nothing out. There's no other science fiction or fantasy out there. I, I have to say, okay, there was Raiders of the Lost Ark. There was Back to the Future. There were really good science fiction and fantasy movies, but they were so few and far between that they're almost like world shaking. You're like, holy cow, I don't know what that was. That was awesome. But that it wasn't the same kind of world. Now here I am like, my day <laughs> <laughs> you just like set a chicken on fire. <laughs> but anyway, um, so so uh, that's the way it was. We liked it. So um, I I was no, I would watch these movies. I'd watch like Raiders of the Lost Ark and be like, wow, that blew my mind. And it wasn't like it is today, where you can like you could be like, now I'm gonna wait till that comes out on Netflix in a couple of months, and I'm gonna watch it over and over again, and I'm gonna see like clips of it and see people like talking about it on clips on YouTube, and which is what I do now with like. Avenger, you know, all the Marvel movies or any movie that I really like, I, I dissect it endlessly and there's yeah. all this stuff around it and you hear like quotes from all the people in it are talking endlessly about it and you know everything about it and you can just endlessly gorge yourself on this stuff. Whereas back then, something like Raiders of the Lost Ark would come out 
and you'd see like Roger and Ebert talking about it for like five minutes on their at the movie show, or I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it went through like several iterations. At the movies, S- S- Cisco and Ebert. Movies are... Cisco and Ebert. Yeah. Uh, oh, Roger. Did I say Roger and? Yeah. Ebert? <laughs> I was thinking of like Roger and me versus Roger and Ebert. <laughs> so um. So anyway, so you'd watch that, and there'd be like a couple of like articles, or like you know, Good Morning America would run a piece on it. And you'd be like, oh, cool, they're talking about Raiders and the Lost Ark. And then, like, that would be it. And you wouldn't hear anything about it for years because there wasn't even an option to, like... But your, you know, friends, but your friends would be talking about it. So, so you'd, you'd be like, oh, wasn't that great in that movie? And it was... I don't know. I just remember being, like, really, really excited about movies and just talking about them all the time. Remember that scene? Yeah. Remember that scene? Yeah, so you would talk about it, but the bad movies were what kept you going in between. Yeah. <laughs> even, yeah. though you, even though you and your friends would talk about it, like, that wasn't the same as, like, you were just, like, jonesing. You're like an addict who, like, you're like an addict in a world where heroin hadn't been invented yet. You're just like, <laughs> I want that so bad, but I can't get it. You're like uh, in Drawing of the Three, the Eddie character who gets who gets sucked into this other world where he can't he can't have any heroin. So, like, <laughs> so, like these bad wow. movies would pop up. And you'd have, like, Crawl, and you'd be like, oh, thank you, somebody made a fantasy movie. And you wouldn't really sit there and go, this is a bad movie, because you'd be like, it's it's fantasy. How can I call it bad? It's fantasy, yeah. and it's here. And you'd have, like, you know, and, and uh, well, when it, by the time it got to Masters of the Universe, I think I was, like, I was, like, in college by then, or almost in college, and, and that movie, definitely, I was like, yeah, I don't care about this one. Yeah. But all the other, like, Beastmaster, oh, my gosh, I think I was in junior high, or maybe like a freshman in high school and Beastmaster came out and I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. This guy can control animals with his mind. It's Dungeons and Dragons. He's got like two ferrets, which are so cool. All right, wait, wait. All the, wait, 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 we're going to deep into it, but we'll get into the ferrets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I have a whole segment about the, got the excited ferrets. There. All right. I don't Stop with the heroin. Your... Yeah. I don't want a premature fair, <laughs> but but anyway, so so it was it was fantastic stuff because it was there and it was fantasy and it filled the need. And only in retrospect can I actually look back and call them bad movies. Wait, so Tom, did you see these in the theater? All of these? No, I saw none of them in the theater. I saw I can't remember. I had like all these this group of friends that played D and D. We basically were the kids from Stranger Things without the supernatural element in our lives. <laughs> Um, but we watched a Beastmaster I saw in my friend Seth's basement and I don't remember. I think he probably had his dad had like rented a VHS unit for the weekend because like <laughs> nobody owned them and like, and, and we got the tape from like a video rental store. Like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, like drinking like Mountain Dew and eating pizza in the basement. Oh and, like, God. Um, yeah, it was all, we were basically Beavis and Butthead and friends. Um, <laughs> And then, but then, yeah, all these movies, I, I didn't, I can't think, I don't, I know I didn't see Crawl in the theater. Um, there was, there was definitely one of them I saw in the theater, but I just can't think off the top of my head which I, one it was. I definitely saw Legend in the theater because I remember being all hyped up to see it. Um, the other ones I'm pretty sure I didn't. I, I, yeah, I'm certain yeah. I didn't. I'm certain well, I saw them, like, I don't well, know, well, it, you, you know it, at home. You mentioned being all hyped up to see Legend. I can remember, I think at the time, I don't think I saw it in the theater, but I can remember there was a lot of hype around it. Like this was was. just a visionary masterpiece. Well, it's Ridley Scott. It's Ridley Scott. So, yeah, it's Ridley Scott. So, and, and looking at it when I was watching it yesterday, I was like, this is visually gorgeous. It is a visually beautiful Ridley Scott film. Oh, yeah. Everything else about it is terrible. (laughs) Everything else. (laughs) You know, but. But the thing is, also, what was I, um, was it Crow? Crow is, di- is directed by David Yates, who is a great director. Let me just check my notes. I'm pretty sure it's Crow. Um, David Yates produced, uh, P- I'm sorry, Peter Yates produ- uh, wrote, uh, directed, um, Breaking Away and a bunch of other really great movies from the 80s or uh, 70s oh, wow. and 80s. So, it's not like he was a bad director. It was just there was nothing good about that movie. But but uh, it's Wait not like he was some schlock. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the music in Crawl, by the way. Oh, as, honey, if as... you go into the music, boy. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, uh, well, we'll get to we'll get to we'll get to the movie in a second. But um, I'm watching Crawl, and and I'm like, this music. It's so stirring and moving, and I feel like I've heard it elsewhere. And then I so I I looked it up. It's the same guy who did the Wrath of Khan. Oh. And, and I think I think he steals from himself too, because I'm like oh, I'm the, sure trump, the trumpet's going. 
I'm like, wait, is the Enterprise gonna just fly in right now? Like, wait, this is the same. This is the same music. But uh, okay, we'll get we'll get to the. the well, yeah. well, why not crawl in the theater? By the way, you did. I did. Oh. I saw Crawl and I saw uh, Masters of the Universe. I remember my friends were really big into the He-Man uh, action figures. I was not sure. a huge He-Man person, but so they loved it. Oh my God, it was so good. I think that was the 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 first time I was like, yeah, I don't know about this one. <laughs> um, but but uh, you know, I I loved I loved Crawl then, and now I love it for its campy cheesiness. It's well, super campy. Yeah, let's just talk about Crawl because I, I I can't stop okay. you guys. It seems like you I can't, can't stop, stop you guys. It. Yeah. Um. But so so Andrew, I mean, you said that Legend has great visuals. I thought Crawl had some great visuals in it. Um. I mean, I a lot it of the... looked. You know what it reminded me of? Like um, like Geiger paintings. Like a lot of the you know the stuff where she's trapped in the castle thing. And oh, she's running was, through them. Yeah, like a Dolly, Dolly as Dolly meets Geiger. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah, I thought it was beautiful, but it's also one of those things like it's like beautiful visuals with a terrible story. Just kind of like who cares? Well, let's just set up the horrible story in case anyone hasn't yes, seen it. Please. So, so there's a, uh, it's in this sort of fantasy or kind of like medieval kingdom, and uh, they're being attacked by basically aliens who have sort of landed on this giant mountain castle. And, um, and so there are these, these two feuding factions and of the humans and they decide to unify against the aliens by marrying the, you know, the prince of one family to the princess of the other. Um, but then the princess gets kidnapped and is held by the alien overlord who's sort of this giant, like frog monster like or something. Cthulhu. He's basically Cthulhu yeah. that speaks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he wants her to marry him. And so the hero has to gather, um, you know, the prince has to gather a bunch of companions and set out to rescue her. And it's very episodic. It's this very, like, plot coupon episodic yeah. story, <laughs> um, you know, where they go to the swamp and then they go to the cave and, and so on. Um, and then ultimately he gets a, a a magical weapon called the glaive, which is kind of like a killer boomer, like a bladed boomerang weapon. Uh, and then... Um, you know, that he saves the princess in the end. So that's the plot. So, um, uh, so Tom, what did you, you, you thought that crawl was good. Did you say when you first saw it or do you still think it's good? Well, absolutely not. I mean, but I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think it was, I don't know that I thought it was good at the time. I just was psyched that it was fantasy. And I, I think the first time I was really like, I think when I, when I first saw like Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the first Lord of the Rings movie, uh, that came out in the when was that in the two, early 2000s yeah i, I, I was think it was like, 2001 holy, was it 2001 i was like holy cow finally somebody did a fantasy movie right but before that i was like i i watched crawl and i was like hey it's fantasy and i was like eh, it kind of stinks that it doesn't measure up to like the good movies that you can watch that aren't fantasy but i'm just psyched that it's fantasy so no i wasn't i wasn't like i didn't, wasn't like i think i was like 14 or something i wasn't like oh my gosh this is a great movie but i was like oh cool it's fantasy it's so awesome mm -hmm. i mean what would you say if you is there anything you think is is genuinely good about it looking at it now mm, not really i guess i mean i i, I do oh, think come it, on I, 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 st I still i mean the glaive is cool right like what a cool weapon he can throw it and it comes back to him even if it does look kind of like even if it does look kind of like eerily like you didn't a, think like the a... widow of the web was like a cool scene where if you got Freddie Jones yeah. crawling across and then he's got his sand, his time is going to run out. His sand is his time. And he's like, I yeah, can't okay. stop it. She goes, you can't stop time. I mean, <laughs> come on. The, the lines are so campy that there's, they're brilliant, you know? Yeah. In that sense. Yes. Yes. There are cool things like that about it. I actually I agree with you, Matt. I thought the Widow of the Web sequence was probably the best sequence in the movie. I mean, I, I think one of the big weaknesses of the movie is that there's so many characters that almost none of them get that, that like the character development is spread out over so many characters that it it yeah. really diminishes, you know. But but that 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 part where there's the the wise old wizard or whatever, and he has he he had this relationship with the spider witch or whatever and yeah, right. like i thought that that you know that was the most sort of most emotionally moving. affecting yeah. part of the movie and the best character development which was you know weird because well, he's such a he's such a minor well, character they're the two they're the two best actors in the film i mean yeah. freddie jones is just amazing in anything he does and i don't remember uh, francesca nice 
Yeah. And, and who, she, who, by the way, just want to point out, Freddie Jones through for Hawat and Dune. Francesca niece is um, uh, Jessica. Right. In Dune. That's yeah. right. Yes. There you go. Um. But yeah, no that that scene was was I found it to be really affecting. We're right, but but to me the the biggest weakness of this movie and a lot of these movies is that the hero has virtually no character development at all. No. Um, yeah, and, and 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 in the five movies you 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 sent us, uh, you know, uh, Beastmaster, Crow, Legend, Highlander, and Masters of the Universe, four of the five actually have the exact same plot. <laughs> they're all, yeah. they're, all, they're all the the mono myth. Right. It's also like this boy, this farm boy who's like chosen and then he has to save the world from the evil menace uh, who also just happens to like capture the, you know, uh, you know, the beautiful damsel in distress who, by the way, uh, in in all of these films, I was kind of struck by how um, like helpless they 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 wrote the women. Um, of course. That, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I was like, huh, you know, it's a story about like uh strength and power and so i was i was that's the one thing that i found like redeeming about masters of the universe is like you know they're going to show a powerful you know a woman at least like man at arms daughter i mean like she kicks ass i thought so I, and I evelyn and evelyn of course right yeah. so okay okay like, yeah but wait 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 wait, was... wait 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 let's get to the female characters in in just a second because but wait before i i i, I didn't want to finish my thought which which was that Tom mentioned that he used to play Dungeons and Dragons with all his friends yeah. and they always tell you don't make a novel by just taking your Dungeons and Dragons campaign and just turning it into a story <laughs> and I feel like all these movies uh maybe with one or two exceptions but like they feel like well crawl specifically feels like yes. someone just took a Dungeons and Dragons campaign and just turned it into a narrative without yep. making any of the necessary adjustments you would need to make to uh Real to turn characters. It... Yeah, yeah. But it's just well, like, you know, it's it's all, a lot of, you know, physical stock danger. Stock characters. It's all stock characters, stock plots, everything. It there was nothing different about it. For, and and even then it wasn't, you know, different. Like now we have a range of fantasy stories, fantasy movies that are different and interesting. Um this was sort of the beginning of that fantasy rage um but it, it it just stuck to that basic plot of hero heroine damsel in distress a group of companions quest end of story kind of thing which makes you like really want to uh, i'm going to show how ignorant i how stupid i am right now because it makes you really want to have a time machine because you know if i had a time machine i wouldn't use it to like save the world or anything like that <laughs> maybe i'd use it to go back in time where the bar was set really low and be like write these scripts and people be like oh my gosh this is brilliant <laughs> like yeah there's like character development either that or they'd be like what are you putting this character development in here kids don't need this <laughs> yeah this is, this is superfluous strike this I, I would i would guarantee you would get that reaction from somebody but, in a studio but i think what's what's great about crawl is the fact that they use these stock characters so they're like look we're not going to go into that whole deep character development thing we're just going to give you like a few clues into who they are like oh you know the old wizard you know the the swashbuckling hero and then we're just going to go like we're just going to put everything in there we're going to put the kitchen sink in there we're going <laughs> to yeah. we're going to have like weird aliens that when you kill them there's like this this i don't know like alien um you know like from thing. the movie alien the yeah. the, the Slither uh, out, yeah, the thing slithers yeah, the, out. Yeah, the chest there. chest burster coming yeah. out like just, they scream. <laughs> like let's just throw that in there. Let's just have a you know a, a quicksand and a swamp. You know, um, I mean, let's have a you know shape uh, changelings, shapeshifters, and uh, you know one of the coolest um, conceits of that for me was this idea that you know <laughs> it's also completely ridiculous is that you have this <laughs> ship that can travel across. Uh, you know, space and time and land on a planet, but they need to move it every day because, you know, <laughs> otherwise they'll be found. I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I, I did, I did find that was it was a, an interesting conceit for the, for the film, this idea that they needed a, a seer, a, a psychic to see where the, the, uh, the fortress would be, uh, every day, which, which I, I found, uh, yeah, it, it was fun. It, it was a cool, you know, like you always have to have some kind of challenge like that. And so, so I really enjoyed that aspect of it, and and I thought 
the fire mayor scene. I mean, yeah, it's completely ridiculous. They're like, <laughs> we need to travel a thousand leagues. Fire mares. Fire mares can do a thousand <laughs> leagues in a day. Like we never heard of them before, but let's just throw fire mares yeah. in it. And then, well, and wait, then, wait, can I just? Sorry, I got to jump in on the fire mares. So, yeah. could you just explain to me, like, if there are these fire mares that can ride across right. a continent in one day, and they're not that hard to get, why does anyone ever ride a normal horse? Right, exactly. I guess because the idea was like they were wild, they were crazy wild horses, which they just happened to, you know, uh, tame and and uh, break, so to speak, in in about five minutes. So they're like, there they are, and then and then they're like tearing across the countryside, leaving trails of fire, and then the next thing they're flying, <laughs> they're flying, yeah, they're flying, flaming horses, and then so I was like. But it's cool, like that. You ha you see them flying across the sky, and like you know, my twelve year old self is like, "Look at them go!" <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I, I want to point out real quick. Um, I guess it's going off your point, uh, Tom, about how, um, like we didn't have a lot of great movies back then, and oh, it's fantasy, and so you just got on board. Um, as I was watching Crawl in particular, it really struck me how similar it was to star wars now granted star yeah. wars is a very you know um the story you know it's like it's like that that uh what did lucas read uh what's his name the monomyth yeah Joseph yes Campbell. it is the monomyth. the monomyth yeah but star wars does it well this actually takes a bunch of star wars tropes like you know the farm boy um it, it lear is an obi-wan kenobi character Ergo is a C-3PO character. There's twin sons on this world. Um, so they take a bunch of stuff from Star Wars. And also, uh, to your point about the lizards, when the thing, the killers or slayers die, the, the, uh, the, this the, uh, chestburst aliens. Yes, the aliens. Yeah. Um, they actually are stealing from mov great movies that came before them, Star Wars and, and aliens. Yeah. And using it, but they're just not using it well. So it's like this, right. it was like this cheap way of, of getting on, of getting the heat from Star Wars and from aliens and using it to try and suck in stupid kids, frankly, I think is what that was about. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and clearly worked because we're all here talking about it 40 years later. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's not, I don't think it wasn't. Well I don't think those movies were created in a vacuum. They were in response to the success of Star Wars and Aliens, um, but they're, they're cheap mirror images of those yeah. really good movies. Let me jump in on the the idea of them not being original, because let me just note a couple of things I, I noticed. So Beastmaster and Masters of the Universe both involve a hero in a loincloth, like a bodybuilder yes. in a loincloth. Uh, Krull and Beastmaster both involve a killer boomerang. Uh, Beastmaster yes. and Highlander both involve telepathic contact with animals, and Crawl and Legend both involve the girl being abducted and wooed by the monster villain. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. can see there's like a very like constrained terrain of tropes that all of these I felt movies like I was are watching the same movie over and over again, yeah. just with just with different actors and different sets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and in Masters of the Universe, like that, I was shocked to see how how much that owed to Star Wars. Like the the yeah. guy, the guys in the helmets, the black, the Darth yes. Vader helmets. I was like, what is that? They yep, where did they, absolutely. Did they raid Darth Vader's wardrobe? <laughs> yeah. And, they, and when <laughs> and when they, Skeletor first walks in, yeah, it's, it's the almost theme. like the Emperor. In, in, yep. Uh, yep. It's exactly like the they, they even even the music was like yep. Darth Vader's theme. I was right. like, whoa! I didn't know it, but I didn't notice it back then because I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of like how if you listen to a lot of music now from the 70s a lot of it you're like whoa is this the beat that's not the beat my wife would yeah. even say like my kid will be like who's this and my wife will be like that's the beatles and i'll be like no honey that's not the beatles but uh but <laughs> yeah. because like everybody was trying to sound like the beatles but back then you didn't notice it because you're yeah. like oh it's just what music sounds like yeah exactly and also let me just note the the other like main a uh, piece of material that every, everyone is drawing from, obviously, is Robert E. Howard. There's, like, such yes. a Robert E. Howard, you know, thing going on with, with so many of these movies. And I'll, I'll also say, you know, there are actual um, Robert E. Howard adaptations that are also awesomely bad by any definition. But oh, yeah. we're not going to talk about them because we already talked about them all in episode 77. But you've got your Conan the Barbarian, which is actually sort of okay. But then you've also Conan, got your... Wait, 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 wait. Conan the Barbarian? The movie... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a great movie. Just it's FYI. Great. I, I would say it's great. I it's it's a, a genuinely non-ironically I'm saying this in completely non-ironic way. It is a great movie. 
Okay, I, I love it. it. Fight I mean, me. Wait, 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 wait. We're not talking about you we're, couldn't. We're not talking about Conan the Barbarian. It doesn't. Okay, okay. By your own statement, it doesn't fit this uh, topic. Um, no, no, I agree. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm also going to mention there's Red Sonia and Conan the Destroyer, which are definitely bad by any. I right. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but, but if you want to hear about those, go check out episode 77. But I just want to note that there's a lot of Robert E. Howard ripoff stuff going yes. on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I had actually never seen Masters of the Universe before. And maybe it's because this it was the first of these that I watched. I watched them in kind of reverse uh, Rotten Tomatoes ranking order. Uh, I was a big He-Man fan as a kid, but I actually found this pretty enjoyable. Um, the, um, the the <laughs> The first 20 to 30 minutes are abysmally awful. Um, and you know, don't introduce the characters at all. And it's just like, we like so weird and random, yeah. but once they got to earth and they meet Courtney Cox and I, I thought it actually got kind of fun to me. <laughs> and, um, what the heck? uh, and I actually, some of the stuff I thought was, wait, I made a couple of notes of things that I actually thought were kind of cool. Wait, where's that? Um, but I liked, they put this like, um, what do you call it? A, um, something around the guy's neck, um, that makes oh, that, him tell the, 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 the collar, the collar. Yeah. They, that was the, by the way, that was the only time I liked that character throughout the movie. I, w- I wish they had that call around on the whole time because he just kept shouting the rest <laughs> yeah. of the movie. <laughs> yeah. But I thought that, that, yeah, it's the collar of Al Druber, which makes him sort of makes him tell like, the truth. Yeah, makes him tell the truth and he's kind of hypnotized. And I actually thought that was, you know, pretty cool and legitimately sort of disconcerting. Um, yeah. I like the guy that just keeps handing evil evil Lynn like yeah. stuff like the collar. He's like, here we go, I'm the collar. Like here, give me give me you know, give me give me the thing that gives a holographic display of the key. Yeah, I got that here. Like what else you got in that bag? Is there a you have a bag of holding over there? I mean, what is he carrying him? But I mean I mean the movie, I mean, it has a lot of flaws, obviously. Just you know, like I said, it's seventeen percent on Rotten Tomatoes. But the um just the idea of the the people from Earth coming face to face with these you know, crazy technology that they couldn't even have imagined. And like, I just love that sort of parallel worlds kind of stuff. And I thought there was one line in the movie I thought was legitimately great. So the sorceress says, men who seek power, look back at the mistakes of their lives and call it destiny. I actually yeah. thought that was pretty good. That was cool. And actually I thought the actor who played Skeletor was really That's good. Frank I, Langella. A... Yeah. He was yeah, great. Yeah. He was good. Wait, Frank Langella? Who, who, what's he been in? Cause that he, was the, he was the original movie Dracula in the 70s. He's like a fa- classic actor. He was in the, okay, uh, yeah. the TV series The Americans recently. He played uh, okay. a Russian spy. Okay, because he was so out of place in this movie. Yes. Like, every time he was on screen, I was like, what, how did this guy like agree to be in this? Because yes. he brings the whole thing up by like several notches, oh, yeah. even though he, oh, yeah. he can't save it. But he's, every time he's on screen, you're like, wow, he's like really yeah. good. Well, actually, what it reminded me of, one of my favorite movies, and I'm sorry I'm getting off the point here, uh, Dave, but uh, um, Flash, uh, Flash Gordon – the oh, 1980 oh, version, oh, which is, oh, I know yeah. there's a whole nother cover. That's my, one of my favorite movies, but that movie, Ming, is played by, uh, Max von Sydow, who it is It remind movie. me a lot of Flash Gordon. Actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yes. yeah, they get these great, great classic actors to play the villains, which is great. But then what they get the, these really the crappy Rotten actors. Tomatoes rating of, of oh, Flash God, Gordon. who the hell knows? But that's definitely got to be in the bad science fiction. Yeah, well, fiction. yeah, well, no, we're we're saving that for the awesomely bad eighty science yeah. fiction panel. But yeah, I, I agree that Skeletor was was really good. He was so committed, you know, like he yep. was never phoning yeah. it in this whole yep. movie. Exactly. And, and there's like at the end, he gives this when he um gets all the power. He he gives this sort of like monologue, which is actually really pretty good. Um, yeah. And I guess I didn't say what the plot the plot quote unquote is, but um, basically, <laughs> yeah. you know, He Man is this uh, toy line. <laughs> which was there's actually a really good documentary called I think the toys that made us something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know that. Oh one. yeah. And but but he man, it was like so like cynical. It was just like a total like money making like let's let's mm-hmm. make money off of kids and we're, we're going to rip off I think Conan the Barbarian and the reason he rides a big cat is because they could just get the rights to this big cat, um <laughs> you know toy, but it didn't it wasn't and the, the cat same was scale missing from the movie, which I find very very upsetting. Oh, that would be hard to do with eighties special that was effects. Upsetting. Very it upsetting. Have, it it would have been hard, but but that was upsetting, and also there was no Orko, which was a bother. But they had the other the other guy, yeah, the other by the famous guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was kind of the Orko stand-in. But I I, I distinctly remember 
in the 80s seeing that and being like, what the heck is this and where's yeah. Orko? But I, then thinking, yeah. like, well, they couldn't have done Orko because how are they going to do that? All right, well, let me just finish explaining. So, so, so Battle Cat, the reason that He-Man rides a giant cat is because they just had this giant cat, this cat toy, and it was a different scale than all the rest of the figures. So they just put it in the line and he's like, oh, it's a giant yeah. cat. Um, but, um, but yeah, and, then, Brilliant. and this document, it's really funny because it goes into like, because He-Man became such a phenomenon, the toys and just like anything they could think of, they were making toys of and the it just got so stupid like like you know once you're into like the hundredth he-man action figure um but so anyway so so it was really popular so they made this live action movie out of it um and and so the characters from this stupid fantasy sci-fi kind of cartoon worlds go to earth and uh you know and and, and ah, that's, that's basically the plot well, but well, there's um a, there's a scene there's a scene um which is very similar to star wars you know where where darth vader's getting all the assassins to go to go after yes uh, and and there's a scene in in masters of universe where where skeletor is basically introducing the toy line he's like yeah. you know beast man like beast in, you know, man. 1995 <laughs> the toys are us yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. But the but the the He Man is played by Dolph Lundgren, who was oh, yeah. I, is it Ivan Draco from Yes, yes I must yeah. break you. I must break I must you. Break you. And I haven't seen any movies he was in in a long time, except maybe the uh, what do you call it the the, the Punisher? No, no, the, the we're all it's like all the action heroes from the eighties are oh, all in the, a movie the together. The Indestructible? No, the. Uh... Oh, the that yeah, one, uh, the Unmentionables. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like that. That's a God. different movie. But like he, Expendables. 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 Oh, right, right, right. Unmentionables. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's but a, he that's is a porn version of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd pay to see that movie. Yeah, yeah. I but he is a bunch of a bunch of sixty-something-year-old men. Ugh. <laughs> oh. Porn. Ew. Hey, oh. wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, but let me let me just say he is unbelievably awful in this movie like to the yeah. degree i wasn't even does he speak english like i wasn't he, he's swedish i looked it yeah, up he speaks english but he speaks he english was, he was in the punisher actually which was like the was tv show or the movie, movie? Was, no the movie there was a marvel movie in like the late 90s early 2000s of the punisher that was actually like not it was it wasn't awful it wasn't good or great but it wasn't terrible but I'm pretty sure it was him. He was he played well, the lead. He played the punch. He's actually he's actually been like recently in 2016 or 17, he played uh Konstantin Kovar in Arrow on the CW show and he was huh. excellent. Hmm. He was fantastic. I got hmm. I'll I give mean, it to after him. After a while, I guess you just like Schwarzenegger, he started out awful and he actually yeah. got some acting skills after, you know, after yeah. doing it for a long time. I mean, he's playing just like this Yeah, it's not I I'm tempted to say one dimensional, but it's really not one dimensional, you know, evil Russian mob boss. Um, but he's really good. And it's just got this nostalgia to it that he's showing up, you know, as a Russian in, in a superhero show. Um, it, it, it's one of their better seasons. So, and he's really good. So I'll just, I'll give him props there. Yeah. But I mean, he was I... also just, he was also just in Aquaman too. Okay, yeah. So I, I, maybe he's gotten better, but in in Master of the Universe, I, I I literally wondered if they had just given him his lines phonetically and he didn't actually understand yeah. what he was saying. Yeah, I did hear really that funny. about the guy in Highlander, though. That he was he his English was bad, so he they gave him. I think he was French, right? Uh, what's his no. name? The actor. Um, Christopher Lambert. Christopher Lambert. Is that? I mean, this, no. this is word of mouth. So this yeah, I don't think incorrect. that's true. That's not true. Okay, I don't think so. Uh, he's actually maybe he's Belgian or something, but. Highland is a whole other thing. Highland is a whole discussion. We will per yeah. perhaps I don't yeah. need to supersede your your authority, Dave, but we'll talk about Highlander last, maybe. Yeah, no, I definitely. Have a lot to say about Highlander. No, because it's definitely the best of these. It's it's sixty eight percent, so it, it's just barely bad enough to qualify for this panel. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what if so we talked about? Oh, so let's talk about uh, Beastmaster. Um, <gasps> we can get to the. Uh, ferrets now i guess um koto and poto well can i can i put in one thing about masters of the universe before we go yeah yeah sure um i i, I was actually a fan of the original tv show as mercenary as i knew it was back then and i was too old for it i think i was like 17 years old but i would get home from school from high school and i would sit down on the couch and i'd be like get myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and be like oh there's fantasy there's like something i can watch that's kind of fantasy-ish and it actually like had there was so many enjoyable things about the show that I really liked, even though I was embarrassed that I watched it, that I ever watched it. 
Like I would never tell my friends I watched it, but I would watch it. And my friends, kid, my friends' little brothers would watch it, and I'd like talk to them about it and be like, "Isn't this cool when this happens?" or whatever. <laughs> but there were cool things about the show that didn't make it in the movie that really disappointed me in the '80s when I saw it because there was like you know this whole like Clark Kent Superman thing with He Man, where yes. he was like this kind of nerd. I mean, he's the you know he's the prince of all Eternia, so how much of a nerd yeah. can he be? <laughs> he's kind of a nerd, and then he turn, he gets this sword, and he raises it in the air and says, I have the power, and suddenly he gets giant <laughs> muscles, which I was like, when I was 17, I was like, oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> but um, but, um, but so, so they had that, and then in the movie, he's just like He-Man through the whole thing. He never, like, has to struggle with, like, not being strong enough. So I was like, oh, that's kind of lame that they never had yeah. him be like, but how could they with Dolph Lundgren? Like the back then, yeah, no, you can't didn't have CGI where they could like make him look. He, he does right. say I have the power that one time when that he gets one his time. sword back. Yeah. He sort of yeah, mumbles he says, it. Says it all wrong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have the power. power. <laughs> yeah, do I? I'm not sure. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly. the point where you're, you're rooting for Skeletor. It's just, yeah, you're like, Jesus. come on, Skeletor. Just take over the right. universe yeah. already. <laughs> and and one thing that they could have had in the in the movie that they had in the show that was so much fun was they had this character called Ram Man who was like really dumb. Oh yeah. And all he would yeah. do is like run and like smash his yes. head in the Yes. I yes. forgot about that. Do. Yes. And they and they totally could have done that in the movie. And he was <laughs> funny. Like he was great comic relief. And I was like, why not? Like why would you put these these other also rands that I didn't even remember from the show in yeah. there. They had like these four henchmen and I the only one I remembered was Evil Lynn. I didn't oh and Beast Man, but I, I didn't remember, remember Beast those Man other and Evil Lynn. I don't remember the other two, yeah. Yeah, so I, I forgot really about like, Ram Man. That was awesome. Well, it was Ram Man, and then and then there was a guy who could like spin his head around and be different people. Like I can't remember who that was. <laughs> yes! But I, but I, I, he was like three different people, and the toy had like three faces on it. But um, anyway, so well, there was a lot of things about the about the. I, I actually would have liked watching three or four episodes of the cartoon more than this movie. Yeah. Well, let me say, Tom, I mean, maybe it's just because I, lo I, I love that cartoon as a kid. And I, I don't know if people who didn't love it as a kid would have the same reaction. But that intro where he says, you know, the day I held aloft my magic sword and said, by the power of Grayskull, there's something that still kind of gives me chills about that, that intro yeah. sequence. Yeah, embarrassingly for you and me, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I... I Wait, actually, let me just say, up. in the uh, one other thing I liked in the movie is the the design, the physical design of Castle Grayskull. I thought was super cool. Yeah, yeah. One, I don't know if I'm making this up or not, if I'm having delusions, but I think they might be making another He-Man movie. Am I? That'd be cool. I, I, I haven't heard. I think I might have read that plot? somewhere. You know, it's and cool. it's you can actually do it now. Give it, do it justice. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, they're making everything else from the 80s. Yeah, I know, so. exactly. They're right. making everything else. It's probably just wishful thinking. But, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they did remake yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Beastmaster. So Beastmaster, let's see. There's this um, – uh, there's a king or something, and he has a son. But somehow these witches get involved, and then his son ends up being transferred into a cow and being born. And this gives the son the ability to communicate. Wait, can, I, can I just – Talk about that scene, by the way. Sure. Like where the baby is is like stolen from the woman. Oh, oh, you, oh, you t tell 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 the the story. For yeah. Uh, so so so, okay. so the fact that he was born from a cow, I think, gives him the ability to communicate telepathically with animals. But he grows up not knowing who he that he's a you know a prince, prince or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then his he's living with this in this sort of village, and the village gets destroyed by um Attila the Hun type. Raiders, they're called Juns rather than Huns, I think. Um, and then <laughs> that, that disguises it. Change. <laughs> and and so he becomes sort of a, a lone wandering adventurer, and he's super ripped, um, and he's dressed <laughs> and in a loincloth, of course, right? Yeah. Yes. And um, and so basically, he uh, finds this city with a ziggurat where they're doing human sacrifices, and. Uh, falls in love with this like slave girl there, and basically ends up rescuing the people from you know like freeing the people from from slavery basically. From evil red torn and squawking a lot to his. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so so Matt, what did you want to say about well, his? I I guess I just kind of it's more of like a logistics thing. So so like the the evil witch steals the baby who is presumably like the the heir to the throne and puts it into this cow. And then to me, it looked like it was just five minutes later. She just cuts open the cow 
and takes the baby out. And I was like, well, did you really need the cow in that step? <laughs> like, I mean, you could have just taken the baby. I mean, what, did, like, I, I, it just seemed to me like the witch just went like, okay, I got the baby. I'm going to go outside the village and then, and then take the baby out again. But uh, I don't know. But I, I actually, I, I, ha- I have I, to say, Matt, that was not one of my major issues with it. <laughs> well, yeah. But I did. I thought, like, again, just they're they're just like we don't care. We're just gonna put whatever we can in there. They're just like, you know what? We're just gonna put some glow in the dark shit on their throats, and that's just gonna imply that they're like under some spell. And they're, they're like, we can't move. Well, they don't even speak. But I thought that was cool. And I actually found the part where, um. You know her her belly shrinking and then and then you see the cow's belly expanding. I, I was like, that's horrible. It's, that's yeah, horrific. it's creepy. And, and there's actually uh, in the in the film there are some really uh, creepy parts to it. Yes, um, I forget what the creatures are called, but they they yeah. the ones with no mouths. You know what I'm talking about? And like the yeah. the flaps of skin, they're sort of like uh, evil bird monsters. I don't know. <laughs> and, and well, they worship uh, the eagle, right? And yeah. so they like put their arms around, like basically like wrap people in in their cloaks their their wings their like fleshy wings and then when yeah. they open them up again there's just like bones and and ecor steaming it's, bones it's steaming or or like liquid like, like weird liquid yeah it's terrifying it's terrifying and that, as a kid this haunted me well me the, the creatures they create where they put the they put the thing in them and they put the the um they take the oh, prisoners yeah. and they make them into these berserkers creatures that was kind of ridiculous it, but it's kind of scary. Like I remember it's actually scary. kind of being yeah. like creeped out by it. But they're just like, and you cannot control them. And I'm yes. just like, well, then why well, don't you useless. make them? Yeah, exactly. Like, just, you're like, but it's a cool have, idea. If they have no control over them. Then what do they use them for? Yeah. Um. But but okay. So so whatever the weird <laughs> mouthless bird creatures are called, demon birds. They they like give. Vultures. Yeah, they give. The Beastmaster, they give Dar, like, this weird nod at the end. Like, what was that about? Like, yes. <laughs> Do you remember this? And he looks he looks at the thing. He's like, ooh, get away. <laughs> did you I catch that? I think it was kind of like the, it's kind of like the Winkies, maybe, at the end of The Wizard of Oz. They're like, yeah, you freed us. Okay, thank you. We, that's what we wanted all along, but we couldn't. We had to listen to Rip Torn. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's like you're you're one of us, and then Dar's like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're not friends. Let me get this. Yeah, clean. he's like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> All right. So so earlier, you guys were talking about the way that these movies portray the female characters, and I feel like the Beastmaster is a good opening to delve into that subject because it has watching it today the most unbelievably uncomfortable courtship scene <laughs> you could that possibly imagine that was horrible like he basically forces himself on top of like he force kisses her but then he forces himself on top of her and you know watching it now it makes me realize like how much of a kind of a trope this was in 80s movies just not even fantasy yeah. it was just like yeah. oh if the guy's aggressive and annoying enough he'll get the girl and you know and if she says no it's really just you know she's playing hard to get and yeah. like this this yeah. was like it was like one step away from the r yeah. word you know what i'm saying and i was like i was like damn that's 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 messed up and yeah. that I mean, made it, that was that was prevalent in, in westerns and bond yes. movies there's a bond yeah. movie where he, where he does it where and i remember back then seeing those movies and being like I don't get that. Why did they put that in there? Is that supposed to be good or what's going on? Because this is the hero, and I'm, and I know I like this character, but then this happens, and I'm like, am I supposed to like that? Like, I, even back then, even as a 15 year old kid in the 80s, I remember being uncomfortable about those scenes. Well, right. Yeah. So th- there's the physical aggression aspect of uh, in the Beastmaster, but then there's also just the fact that he's completely lying to her, where he's like having his um, black tiger or whatever. <laughs> you know pretend it's going to eat her and then he's like you know so there's yeah there's like the dishonesty and the like aggression combined so it's it's just yeah it's just like super weird and uncomfortable all around yeah well i mean i think that was thank god the culture's changed a little or at least we we're aware of that sort of culture but you know at, at, as a girl in the 80s that was cons- it, it wasn't anything that was questioned that was considered sexy as, as you know, this is how it is. It, you look, and we, and this discussion has been had quite a bit about eighties movies recently. Um, you know, like the John Hughes films 
where, um, you know, like 16 Candles, where he gives his, his drunk girlfriend away, which was played for laughs then. And now it's like, holy shit, that's awful. It's the right. same thing. It's, it's culture has changed and thank God it has. Maybe not quite as much as we'd like, but, um, you know, the, the portrayal of women in, in courtship is, is, advanced at least a little bit and and we can now look back on it and go yeah yeah maybe not that did you andrea when you watched this movie in the 80s did you did you consider yourself part of the audience for this movie uh i don't know cause i can't tell you the first time i saw it it definitely wasn't in a theater um i don't remember like i don't remember my first initial reactions to it other than it's really it's really bad and (laughs) mark and mark singer's mostly naked and there's a bunch of animals uh and ripped horns over the top that's pretty much my only takeaway from it like i had completely forgotten the whole thing with tanya roberts and that and that thing um yeah okay i'm sure that i didn't see it in the theater because i wasn't old enough and it was rated r i think when it came out but um which is the same thing with conan like i couldn't see that in the theater but i definitely saw it on vhs as soon as I could and, um, and loved it. But looking back on it, I, I think like, well, this was not made. This was definitely the people who made this movie were like, this movie is for boys, 17 year old boys yep. or, or 15 year old boys. And it's not for anybody else. And this yes. movie is, is specifically about their struggle. So the, any female character in this would be an object in their mm-hmm. story it would be like something that, if you're cool and you do all the right things, you can get a hot woman. Like, yeah. That's the whole reason that there's a woman in the movie at all. I yeah. Like. What were you guys saying earlier about the other female characters? I mean, like, Matt, you were saying that they're, um, like, uh, victims to be rescued in Yeah, like, I, I, just and... saw, I just saw, I noticed that they, in, in most of these films, uh, the women were, were depicted as these these helpless damsels in distress. And I, and I, I kind of... Uh, I really didn't like that. I wanted to see them have their own power, their own strength. Yeah. And, and, you know, I like in crawl, they had this, this great opportunity where, you know, she's, she's prisoner with the, with the, uh, the alien, the beast. And, you know, she could have like, yeah, like had this interaction with him. And, and you, you almost see this in, um, in legend, uh, where, yeah. where, where she just stands up to him and I will do anything. And like that to me is like, I, I I would have enjoyed it a lot more, but they they like in a lot of times they just they needed the the you know the the hero the male to come and rescue them and and, and, and also yeah. the in crawl there's that scene where he she literally gives him the power to defeat the beast she gives him the fire yes. and he shoots the fire and it's like she is literally giving her power away like right. why doesn't she do that and the weird thing about that is that. Since this does rely so heavily on the tropes taken from Star uh, Star Wars, where Leia is not a damsel in distress. She's sitting no. there waiting to die and has accepted her fate, but then they show up and suddenly she takes over. And she says yeah. to them, this is the thing, the great thing That's about Leia. That's why everybody loves Leia. Exactly. Right. She's a badass. Like, she's exactly. She's not going to just sit down. And, she and, was the yeah. first first female character I remember going, oh my God, she's not... She's not a da- she's not there to be rescued. She's telling all these fucking idiot guys to go fuck themselves. She's taken the weapon. She's shooting well, the bad guys herself, and she's taken over. Like that was the best thing about Leia. And so that was the fact that that they regressed in these movies that are relying so heavily on the narrative from Star from Star Wars um, is just astonishing, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that Star Wars was 77. So you have to keep yes. in mind that all these movies, they've seen Star Wars it's and they're still, you yeah. know, not I following. I think what they took out of it is just, just some of the, the imagery, but less so like the, the, the like story the characterization, itself. The yeah. story. Yeah. I mean, I think they were relying a lot on, on older tropes like the, yeah. the monomyth and, and well, you know, I, some of the Conan stuff and. Yeah, but I but I also I I'll say that I'm not I'm making these assessments as as an adult um and looking back on it not as a 15-year-old I accepted it too that that was like there was Leia but then that's the only time you ever saw that 
and that was the only character you ever, uh, the only female character you ever really saw doing that, aside from Ripley. I was but, just gonna. Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's get, we got to get back to the bad sorry, fantasy sorry. movies. <laughs> um, We're but, talking about good movies now. We can't do that. <laughs> that you're, you're like 100 percent off of the topic because you're talking yes, about good yeah. science fiction movies rather right. than bad fantasy movies. But you guys earlier you started talking about like Evil Lynn and the female villains who are sort of powerful but still always kind of sexy. So, and... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else to say about Evil Lynn or the witches? Well, I mean, that, the... there's that trope of of the evil powerful woman like a woman can be powerful but she has to be evil but also sexy like that's uh, yeah. a, that's an also an old trope you know well, like the sexy woman that... who owns her power is evil you know it, it, apart from courtney cox which i was kind of thinking well courtney cox came along and the masters of the universe what what year was that 1985 is that right? 87. 86? 87? Right. So you're a full a full five years past some most of these other movies. Mm -hmm. So I think what was going on there is maybe some of the executives were starting to clue in. We're starting to be like, well and, and also just from a purely mercenary point of view, they were, you know, they made the He-Man show. They had like all the action figures and they had they started to put some strong female characters into the show. And I think those action figures were probably selling too. And then they came out with She-Ra. The TV yeah. show based it was a spinoff from He Man, but with a female strong character, and I think that probably did really well. I don't know, I haven't looked it up, but I think you know those action figures probably sold too. And they were, and at that point they were like, oh, oh, we can make money girls. this way. Oh, okay, girl. Oh, we get it, girls. Yeah, let's sell let's sell stuff to them too. So I think by then, by the time Masters of the Universe came out, they were probably like, hey, we can put you know we can make Courtney Cox be like her own person. We can have. Tila be kind of a strong, like, hey, you know, chicks can be tough too kind of person. Um, but but Courtney Cox was also, she played the part of the damsel in distress too, you know. She she, she did, but they had Tila in there who's like, yeah. you know, you go, she she makes some really blatantly li blatant line in there at some point. I don't remember it, but she was kind of like, you go girl, like, girl <laughs> power. It was, it, was like, it was like over the top, like, we're going to put this line in the movie yeah. to like, on purpose. And, and I think that wouldn't have shown up five six years earlier and i have to say the most uncomfortable thing in any of these movies for me was watching courtney cox have to hug dolph lundgren in his naked with that you know <laughs> on his naked chest like put her face on his naked chest i was like oh man they didn't pay you enough honey oh actually you, you guys were talking earlier you started talking about how mia sarah in legend is a little bit mm -hmm. more of a like proactive kind of character yes um but let's let me just set up so legend uh, so Tom Cruise plays Jack, who's like, I don't know, some sort of like kid who lives out in the woods with the fairies and stuff. Yeah. He's and a forest child or he's something. He's a forest child. Him, yeah. And his, he's like, his girlfriend is, is Mia Sarah, who is, uh, Ferris Bueller's girlfriend in Ferris Bueller's Day exactly. Off. Exactly. And, and they're kind of like having a young, innocent romance. And then there's this character called Darkness who looks like the devil with giant black devil horns and he's underground in hell. And he sends some of his goblins to go kill a unicorn. And so when, when Mia Sarah, like she wants to touch a unicorn. And so it, it comes close to her because she's young and innocent. And then that gives the goblins the opportunity to shoot it with a, a bow and arrow or something and, and kill it. And then this is ca casts the whole world into eternal winter. And the sun is going to set forever and the world is just going to be in darkness, which is what the darkness devil character wants. And he also like so. Oh, and then he 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 has his goblins kidnap Mia Sarah and then he wants her to marry him. And so then Jack has to get a bunch of like characters together and, and go rescue her. Saber. So basically uh, crawl. Yeah, yeah. So basically the same, same crawl. But but so yeah. but I forget who it was, if it was Matt or something, was saying that she kind of like tricks the devil at one point where – like he yeah, says, okay. um, yeah. you know, she, she, she's like, oh, I'll kill this, the second unicorn. And so he, she has a little bit more agency than, than mm -hmm. in some of these other movies. A little more. Yeah. And then the, um, the, the forest spirit, I, I forget their name. They're, they're talking to Tom Cruise and they're like, shoot her, shoot her. She's going to kill the unicorn. And he's like, no, I trust her. Yeah. I mean, there's also the, the scene, uh, before that when, uh, uh, you know, Tim Curry's character, the, the darkness is trying to, uh, woo her. And, and she, she's, she like for a second seems seductive and then like she gives it back to him and, and then she gets wise and she's like, uh, you know, I'll do what you ask if you let me kill the unicorn. And then you realize she's playing him. And I was like, yeah. okay, that's, that's nice. And, and, uh, um, <laughs> that's nice. I mean, I mean, nice in the, <laughs> nice in the, 
nice in the sense like she's finally had some agency, right? Yes. And I also like thought that she was, um, you know, she she definitely was mischievous. I mean, she got she t- turned the world into darkness, right? But that was an accident. I mean, like at the very beginning, she she pulls the clothes line from the friend, and then yeah. you know she's the one who goes and investigates the the unicorn because she's curious, and so she has this sense of like, oh, she's not just passive character who's just going to sit there and and wait for the the hero to do stuff. Like she is doing stuff, but I I. You know, it's it, it's the same old trope we've seen where she has to be rescued well, by that. The, the um, talking about uh, just she was the one who plunges the world into darkness. It actually just uh, it, I realized that it's the Adam and Eve story right there. Mm-hmm. Like she's the one who she's tempted by the, the purity. Um, she's tempted by the thing that she's told not to do. And she does it. Therefore, the woman is the one who commits original sin and, and plunges the world into darkness. But also, as I was watching it, um, and I think it was probably the first time I'd watched it since I saw it in the movie theater back in whatever, 80 something, um, that it's essentially it's Shakespeare. It's it's you know, there's all these Shakespeare characters. It's it's just a it's this melange of. of yeah, like, like Midsummer Bible. Night's Dream. And yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream and Tolkien and, and, um, you know, there's, there's like nothing new under the sun in any of these movies. Um, and, and pretty much there's nothing new. I mean, granted, there's probably nothing new in under the sun in any movie, but it's just the interpretation and the execution. This was not a very good execution, but, um, I don't know. That was my thought. Well, well I mean, let me say the, uh, like most of the movie I think is just awful. Yeah, um, but the um, the darkness character is amazing. Yeah. Just, well, once like, again, it's it's a great actor doing an evil part. Yeah, and, 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 and with it. amazing makeup and everything. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just looked enormously heavy. Those horns. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. The, I, I was just reading. Apparently, there was one point where um, Tim Curry he just like ripped the whole um costume off because he couldn't oh. stand it and it like ripped his skin off you know because they're oh. supposed to oh. so so they had to like like t- spend a week for him to heal up before they could shoot any more stuff with him oh. um but it was worth it i think i mean uh, it didn't happen to me but uh it, it, it looks <laughs> it looks so great um and it just i i just wish they wouldn't do this when like i, I think it was cool that the, the mia sarah character had a bit more agency but where she's just like i hate you i'll never marry you fuck you and right. then she's like five minutes later she's like oh I'll sacrifice the unicorn for you. And he's like, okay, like, yeah. I'm sure this isn't a trick, you know, like, yeah. 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 I've never been tricked before. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the devil. He's supposed to be the, or I don't know. Smart. He, he looks at, he looks like the devil anyway. He's, you know, you would think he would be into like, Understanding you know, tricks. be wise about trickery and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean like some of these films, you know, obviously they, they have, they're really bad parts, but every now and then, there's there's something they just slip in like a throwaway line. I'm like, oh, that's a really cool idea. And and in that one, he's like, oh, uh, you know, the way I influence humanity is through dreams. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Like like basically, the devil is is like convincing people to change their change the world through through dreams. And I was like, I kind of want to see that film. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but but like you were saying, Matt, with Crawl, is that this movie would be so much more interesting if they just cut out a lot of the stupid cliche quest crap and just yeah. focused on the villain interacting with yeah you know other characters because that's the what that's the interesting part of the story. Yeah, uh, and apparently uh, Ridley Scott wasn't uh, seeing this as the devil. He or maybe he was, but he but he drew a lot of his inspiration from Beauty and the Beast for it. Huh. Hmm. huh. Interesting. I could see that. Yeah. Apparently they had seven. I read they had seventeen drafts of the script, which really surprised me. I was surprised that they had one draft of the script. Yeah. Uh. It might have been a better movie if not for Hollywood, because another piece of trivia I came across is that uh, Tom Cruise absolutely hated the movie when it came out and um, and kind of renounced it and told yeah. everybody to go see the the director's cut, which he thought was a lot better. So maybe oh. they maybe the studio executives again. Uh, Put their hands into it and made it made it worse. I don't well, know if I saw dir- the director's. I don't cut think I have either. I'd like I, to see I the director's cut at this point. But but then again, I think one of the main also main problems of this movie is the casting. Like Tom Cruise, really? I mean, it was the eighties, so they were just sticking him in everywhere. Um, <laughs> but he, you know, I mean, my problems with his general acting aside, 
Um, he's just that, like, I, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just the old lady in me, but I was just like, Can somebody just give him a haircut for, for God's sake. Uh, right. just, the hair in the face is driving me nuts. But like, what was he doing in there? And also like, wh- who is this character? You were saying. He's living in the forest. Yeah. But forest Dave, when, when Dave was exactly like Dave, when Dave talked about it, he's like, well, he's like this forest kid. I'm like, well, what the, what yeah, the hell I know, is like, he? Where does he <laughs> like, I, who I is didn't this know person? if he was an elf or a fairy. At exactly. First and, and, and then you're like, well, I guess he has a family or was he just, you know, was he just raised by elves and fairies yeah. in the woods and on his own? Yeah, yeah, I thought he was like the, um, what do you call it? Um, Lord Grace, uh, Tarzan. He was like Tarzan of the fairies instead of the apes, basically. That's, that's the so impression I had. So how does I he had. speak English? Like, how does he, you know, how does he communicate? How come well, he knows? Well, the fairies all speak English. I'm sorry. But the, right. yeah, but the fairies, like, he's just like this kid in the forest. Who barely has shoes on? Like, why is his t- why are his teeth so white? Like, I, I, I don't know. When I'm starting to deconstruct it this way, I'm like, plan they have a really elves. good dental plan yeah. in the forest. Yeah, those yeah. elves, they're union, real strong. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, let me just elves also also I think like this movie uh, it's stuck out to me as m- well more than the other ones, but it, it stuck out to me with all of them is that the music is just incredibly intrusive and mm. you know like inappropriate like doesn't to my mind doesn't fit the you know you, you had so, so many of these movies yeah it's like a fantasy movie but it's this electronic 80s synth music yep. and it just it just draws attention to itself so much and takes you out of the movie so much yeah it does today but back then it didn't because back then that's what you expected when you went to see a movie that was quote-unquote cool <laughs> if it was if it was a cool movie it it damn well better have synthesizer in it because otherwise you'd be like wait a minute what is this mandolin stuff this isn't a cool movie this this can't be fantasy or science fiction i mean especially i I know jumping the gun a little bit but when you put queen in there with synthesizer for highlander you're like okay this is the that's that's a whole other conversation the queen Queen, that's a whole other conversation i i i love queen just whatever they do oh yeah um and i think the 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 scene in in highlander where he has to say goodbye to his wife that he loved that he stuck with her and then you know they who wants to live for her like i get (laughs) i I get i still get teary eyed and i actually found that scene incredibly affecting uh and yeah and and so you know i i don't know if it's always the case that the music doesn't work but I, I thought in Masters of the Universe the music was horrible. Like it just kept, <laughs> yeah, it, it just it kept, was bad. Yeah, well, it was in Crawl too. There was one point where they're like, I don't know, they're they're riding some horses across, and it was just like this adventure music, like this lighthearted adventure music. And I'm like, oh, this is so terrible. Like when the when I'm listening to the music and I'm going, this is really bad. Like you know, that's a bad movie. Yeah. All right. Well, given the time, why don't we just get into Highlander now? Um, oh, here we go. Awesome. All right. So, so if you haven't seen Highlander, so uh, it turns out that in this world, just apparently randomly, people are born immortal, uh, and so they can't die. You know, they 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 don't grow old, and they can only be killed by having their heads chopped off. And um, over time, they're sort of magically drawn to uh, you know fight with each other. And the last one standing is going to get tons and tons of power. And so we follow this guy and he's born in the Scottish Highlands and discovers that he's immortal. And it kind of cuts back and forth between that and him in New York City in the 1980s when there's only a couple of these characters still surviving. Um, Anything else I need to explain about the plot of this movie? No, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Andrea, so you said that you think that this, you, you don't think that this deserves to be under 70% on Rotten Tomatoes? I absolutely do not think it deserves to be under, I, um, and I will unequivocally, unironically say that this is an excellent movie. Um, the opening sequence itself is just a, a, a masterclass in filmmaking, film storytelling, where there's yeah. very little dialogue, but it immediately grabs you and it tells a story with very little said um it's brilliant filmmaking you start out in the garden there's this um i can't was it a boxing uh match it's boxing right yeah um and there's there's no no, no audience... it's re- wrestling. wrestling it's wrestling and there's this uh holy cow i know sorry, <laughs> um so and it's, it's sorry it's it's madison square garden yeah the That's garden where... Yeah, well, well, when you're talking about the Highlands and stuff, you got to be more specific. Oh, I'm sorry. Madison Square Garden in New York City. And 
there's this audience that is in the garden who is invested in what's going on and they're screaming and they're yelling. And then it is is just this one guy in a trench coat sitting there, not paying attention. That is classic um, Hitchcock right there. Cause you're immediately like, why isn't this guy? Why is this guy there? And the lighting on him. Yes. They have him like in the dark, but it just is like one beam of light. Exactly. His eyes, you know, (laughs) it's immediately intriguing. And then he gets up and then he goes into the, into the parking lot and then there's this epic fucking sword fight and he yeah. cuts the guy's head off and then yeah. all this crazy stuff happens. And then all of a sudden you you pan down with the camera through the floor and you're in yeah. 1500s Scotland. And it's like, holy shit, that Where is how I? you start well, yeah. a movie. Yeah, that is no, how you start a, it's That a great is opener. a great, great movie. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like acting aside... Um, and, and, and the ending, not even the ending, just the, the, that's a whole other story. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to talk to it. It is an actually incredibly well-constructed, well-written, well-made movie. And, and yeah, it just is not a bad movie at all. Yeah. There. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's got the queen soundtrack. Oh, it's got, yes. uh, it's got good music. It's got good cinematography. It's got very clever editing. It's got yep. a great flow through the movie, narrative flow. It's a really clever concept. I mean, it's a yep. different concept than what we usually see in, in any fantasy movie. It's got a cool plot. It's very tightly written. I, apart from the cheesy 80s sentimentality of it all, yes, it's an awesome movie. And back when I first saw it, I was blown away by it as blown much away. as I was blown away by Blade Runner. The first time I saw it, I was first time I saw Blade Runner, same thing. I was like what is this movie? This is yep, unreal. Yeah. And the first time I saw this movie, I felt the same way. And it was only later when they started to like, try to milk it and like release all these oh, yeah. bad sequels. Terrible. And all these like, all these like nerd boys of which I was one started to like worship the character and be like, and, and repeat like there can be only one and wear like dusters. Yeah. And like, you know, try to try to have that like, I'm a loner because I'm cool. Not not like I'm a loner because nobody wants to hang out with me because I'm a total nerd. But but like <laughs> but like you know you'd be like, well, I'm alone. Nobody hangs out with me. But maybe it's just because I'm super cool. <laughs> and that was that was like a cool fantasy for a nerd in in that yeah. time period. So so like it, I think it was that it got that like ethos built up around it that made it made it cheesy by association. But I think in itself when it first came out. It was stunning, and it and it's yeah. still going back and look going back and watching it. I still it's, thought a lot of it held up. It stands yeah. it stands the test of time, and I will tell you that um, I have actually downloaded the screenplay for it just to study, especially that opening sequence, how it works, because it is so good. Um, and and speaking to the, the the soundtrack, I have a thing for movies with Queen soundtracks. So it's Highlander, <laughs> it's um, uh, Flash Gordon, Flash Gordon, and Iron Eagle. Um, they're all, Iron Eagle, arguably the worst of them, but it's bad in a brilliant way, but the soundtrack elevates it. I think, I mean, you might yeah. say that it's like Queen, it doesn't really belong. No, it elevates the narrative. Totally. Um, Queen always is a plus. There, I said it. Fight me. Always a plus. Always a plus. I also like in, in Highlander how they showed how, you know, you know, a, a Scot, a Scottish person from the Highlands in the, you know, the 16th century would, would live in the present day. And then yeah. sa- same with the, the you know, uh, Kurgan, who's just like Kurgan, this, yeah, this, this so warrior. Good. And then in the, in the eighties, he drives like a, a shitty Buick and he's got like, like all these tats and like yeah. you know, leather and like, and listening to, well, he's listening to the queen. Right. But, yeah. But I mean, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I was like, yes, that's what he would be, and if he were born today, and so, yeah. so I thought, I thought they they handled that well. Yeah, and they, and it's also got all these really cool um, reveals where you're like, you're like, oh, what this sword is like from the from yeah. a long time. It's this anti. She folded this metal, and I don't know, you know, metallurgically, it's over two hundred yeah. times. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. folded over two hundred times. How can this be? And then there's all these little mini reveals like that. Like, what is going on yeah. here? You start like finding a little bit more and a little bit more and, and through her eyes you get all this sense of wonder that i i thought was fantastic and, all the, literally fantastic all yeah. the way through it and also just from a personal point of view having grown up in new york in the 80s yes. it's such a wonderful time capsule and that final fight scene on the silver cup sign silver cup. Yeah. is just like so epic i remember when the first time i went to europe i went to uh, london and i stayed in this youth hostel i was like 18 
And in the TV room with all the other, you know, like itinerant children, travelers, they were watching it on TV. And I'm homesick. Like it's two weeks and I've been away from New York and I'm just like, I can't blah, blah. <laughs> And I'm watching this scene and it's in New York and it's on the Silver Cup side. I'm like, that's my home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to offer a counterpoint here. Actually, well, before I, 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 some other things that are good that we haven't mentioned. Well, I mean, his relationship, I think Matt mentioned with the the wife who, in the past, who grows old yeah. and dies, I thought was really, really good. And then Sean Connery, I thought was great in this. Oh, he's, he's um, never he's, not. He's good. fantastic. He's yeah. um, so. Well, let me ask you a question about him. He was. He said, "Oh, I am a Spaniard," but then he's like, "But Egyptian." But he's also Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. But he speaks with the Scottish. <laughs> yeah. But... Well, okay. Wait a minute. I got. I got. I got to comment on this because in the I watched it on Amazon Prime and they have the X-ray thing where the trivia, if you like, hit pause, like this trivia pops up and you can like read things. And there was like a piece of trivia near the beginning. I had to stop and go let the dog out or something, and uh, it popped up and it was like. The Sean Connery's narration at the beginning has an echo on it, not because they added the effect, but because he recorded it in his bathroom, <laughs> in his villa, where his where his voice coach was teaching him how to speak with a Spanish accent for this part. And I was like, how did, well, he nailed it. That guy must have been a genius because... This is such a great Spanish accent. It sounds absolutely nothing different from the Welsh accent. So it's like the best Spanish accent ever because it's like flawless. Like you would never, you would never notice it. So, but then, also, but then his I name is about, Ramirez. Yeah, but he's supposed no. to be Egyptian. Egyptian, I know. I know. Egyptian but then Ramirez. I thought about it. But then I thought about it, and I was like, okay, wait a minute. If Sean Connery's not here to defend himself, if he read that, he'd probably spit out his Glenmore and Geology. He'd probably be like, no, you daft idiot. I was. Not trying to do a Spanish accent. He, he probably like he probably tried it a little bit, and he was like, "Listen, why are we trying to do a Spanish accent? This guy is immortal, right? He's been alive for two thousand years. Why wouldn't he speak with whatever, whatever damn well accent he he wanted to speak with?" He probably was like, "I'm not. Well, I'm not going doing all this work for a Spanish accent." So he probably just gave up on it and was like, "No, I, I mean, you know, he's a pretty masterful guy. He probably was just like, no, let's not do the Spanish thing. It makes no sense. I don't want to do it anyway." Let's just do my accent that everybody loves. Come on, and yeah. and then the guy was probably like, "Yeah, fine, do yeah. do your accent." I don't. And he I don't wear think that he great can. outfit too. Right? Yes, the great. <laughs> you Spanish peacock. <laughs> <laughs> you you great daft haggis. What, what's a haggis? What's yeah, a haggis? that was that was the most brilliant piece of acting in the movie because he had to pretend he didn't know. What he was doing. <laughs> I guess we should explain. Well, I didn't explain that Sean Connery plays this other immortal who who serves as a mentor, basically for the main character. But I mean, I think that what dra what drags this movie down for me is the main character, like his acting is sort of like halfway to Dolph Lundgren, uh, oh, in terms yeah. of just its uh, just total unpersuasiveness to me. Um, but um, and also, I mean, like Tom, you were saying like that so many kind of like what like proto incel type kids in the 80s like latched on to um highlander but i i feel like that's that's totally there in the text i mean you know like like this sort of like the the way that it plays to adolescent fantasy of like oh i'm so badass and i don't care about anyone or, or I, I mean i guess he, he just has the um relationship with his the girl he rescued yeah, uh, in World War One, was it? I'm, yeah, I'm... Two, World War Two. I thought that they, was they cut really part good. of it out. They, they, I actually never knew what that relationship was until I found out that there were parts of it that were edited out. Yeah, I did not remember that scene at all where he yeah. rescues her from the Nazi so soldier. And oh, I, I, that no. Wait, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't remember that scene either when he rescues her. No. Yeah, like I, I think she's she's a, a Jewish refugee. She's like they killed all my family, and then uh, her name is. Uh, Ellenstein, like um, Rachel Ellenstein. Yeah. So, so I, I guess like he saved her from the Nazis, and then so she's like his daughter. You know, his she daughter. Yeah. Her. yeah. It's, it's his daughter, and like uh, that's why they have that close relationship. Which I right. was like, which, oh. which I thought was really, really cool when I saw it this time. But the first time I saw it, you're right. I don't remember that, and maybe that was a director's cut that they put back in. Yeah. But um, but I, but I, I did really like that relationship when I saw this as a teenager. I assumed that they. Back when I was a teenager, this made sense to me. Now it would be like, what? But when I was a teenager, I was like, oh, they had a romantic relationship. Yeah. And, but she got too old. And so, yes. like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't I want you anymore. Thing. 
And and she's like, yeah, that's fine. That makes sense. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. He's more like her mother now. But but now watching it now, I'm like, no, that wouldn't happen. At number one, that wouldn't happen. And number two, now that I'm 50, I'm like, she's smoking. <laughs> she's like, I, would, I don't care if I was I don't care if I was 30. You know, if I looked 30 and I was 500 years old or whatever, I'd still be like, you are you're still a stone fox. And also the same thing with the, it's it's funny. Age is a funny thing because his original wife what was her name Bonnie, I think, which is. Yeah. But her, her, when she got old and she was like laying in bed, she was like still like twenty five and hot, yeah. but with white hair. Oh, <laughs> yeah, was that like, was well, the worst old person. The worst ever. old person makeup it's ever. Like, let's just make her hair white and yeah. make her eyebrows white, and then she'll be old. Yeah, but but she's yeah, still yeah, got like exactly. beautiful puffy cheeks, and yeah, I there's know, like yeah. apple cheeks. Like, yeah. yeah, but but I I think for me to consider this a legitimately good movie, I think I would need a different actor playing the lead role, and she would need to act like 50% less like a teenage boy, um, especially given the fact that he's supposed to be 600, 500 years old or whatever. Um, and also, I think the movie is much, much too long. Uh, does nobody? No, no. I disagree. I disagree yeah. about the movie being too long. I, I've always considered his acting. I mean, I, if he was listening to this, I'd have to say, like, look, it was it was great for, for what I liked at the time. But, yeah, if you had a better actor in it, it would be better. Um I thought the scene between him and his and his secretary, the one, woman we just talked about, who he rescued from the Nazis, I thought he did a really good job in that scene, acting in that scene when he's like telling her goodbye. But I did think that most of the rest of the movie, it was a little cheesy. There's even a line that he delivers somewhere in there, maybe even in that scene where he winks at her and he's like, it's a kind of magic or something like that. That was a little. Oh, when he rescues cheesy. her at the beginning and then and then. uh when he when he's leaving her presumably for the last time when she's older he he says it again yeah he repeats it the part where he repeats it i was like oh yeah that's cheesy but but i thought i don't know i i i thought he was okay in it enough that it worked i agree that if it had been a a much better actor it could have been a much better movie but i still thought it was a really good movie yeah so why do you think it's only 68% on rotten tomatoes just critics don't th- don't appreciate I think it I think no. Uh, well, no. I think I think critics see what you're talking about. I think critics would probably agree with you that there's a lot of that, you know, teenage too much teenage boy in it. But I think also Rotten Tomatoes didn't exist when this came out, and so mm-hmm. a lot of the, um, you know, That's you've removed point, it yeah. from its you've removed it from its decade, and you're showing it to people who are not from that decade, and so they're judging it harshly, and they're judging it, I think, based on a lot of the cheesiness. There's this friend of mine who says that there's a. Um, he made up this idea of this thing called a cheese co truck, which is like this <laughs> truck that drives around. And there's like actors who are like really good actors who are in between movies. And suddenly they don't have a ride. So they're like, they're on foot, they're walking. And they're like, oh, I hope a good movie comes along and picks me up. And they're waiting and waiting. <laughs> He's not coming along. And so the cheese co truck pulls up, you know, and like Ray Liotta is driving it. And he's like, hey, you need a ride? And they're like, oh, sure, I'll hop in. And they hop in this and they get on board this bad movie, not realizing. That it's never going to, the cheese coat truck never lets you off. Once you're on, it, you're on it forever. So like, so Christopher Lambert, you know, I believe after this movie hopped on the cheese coat truck with like successive, successively poor iterations of this movie released, yeah. he hopped on the cheese coat truck and never got off. So now everybody knows he's cheese coat. Like every, all the critics are like, he's cheese coat. He can't have been in a good movie. So I think that drags his tomato meter way down. But I think. <laughs> Had he had he not gotten the cheese, had he been more like Schwarzenegger, who if you watch the original Terminator, it's very similar in acting quality to this movie. But if you, if you watch the the very first Terminator, it doesn't have a lot of great acting in it, especially Schwarzenegger. But Schwarzenegger never hopped on board the cheese coat truck. He stayed with good movie. You know, he, he like waited and waited. No, no, guys, you go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna and, wait and for the next. It's movie. interesting you said Terminator too, because when when I'm I was like imagining Christopher Lambert, you know, sitting in, in Madison Square Garden in this trench coat. I'm like, why does this remind me of somebody? And then I was like, oh, it's Michael Bain from Terminator. He's basically Absolutely. playing like the same kind of huh. guy. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. I, and I think if, if, if Christopher Lambert had just avoided those bad movies and maybe like, you know, worked on his acting, worked on his English and, and gone for like only really good scripts, he could have had a fantastic career. And then, and then people probably wouldn't go back and rate this movie as a 68%. 
I think you have a good point in that, you know, people who are viewing it for the first time now would not have the same uh, affection for it. You know, I, I showed people uh, Flash Gordon and as adults and they just didn't connect with it like I did. <gasps> sure. Sure. Oh. I know, I know. What a sin. Oh, my God. No, that hurts. Like, I just had a little, <laughs> like, angina when you yeah. said that. Wow. <laughs> That's just awful. Awful. Yeah, we're running pretty short on time here. Um, does anyone have anything else? Just general observations or anything about awesomely bad 80s fantasy movies that we haven't gotten to yet uh well what what were those movies that you said we wouldn't talk about that you thought are good well no this is according to rotten tomatoes that these are above 70 percent or higher on rotten tomatoes that people suggested dragon slayer the dark crystal willow and those excalibur are, those are above 70 percent yeah dragon slayer Yep. You said Excalibur too, right? Wait, Excalibur? Excalibur? Yeah, Excalibur. I, I forget, but it's like 80. It's pretty high. It's like 89% or something. Really? Which, are, which I love. I loved Excalibur. But but I, see, that's what I mean. Slow, like, How do you put very... Highlander at 68% and Excalibur at 89%? Yeah. I don't get I mean, the... talk about bad acting. Holy <laughs> good Lord. I am shocked. And Dragon Slayer is just horrific. I'm yeah. sorry. It, it Dragon Slayer is right there with Crawl, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I haven't watched them in so long; I couldn't really say. But let me also say, like, if I had had time to watch more, the other ones that people mentioned that I would have watched were Hawk the Slayer, Lady Hawk, and The Sword and the Sorcerer. Um, oh, Lady Hawk is cute, though. I actually like Lady Hawk. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I remember Lady Hawk pretty well. I mean, um, I think it's like again, it's like pretty slow, but it has a weird beauty to it. Yes. Um, and the premise, I think, is really interesting. It's a, there's two characters, and they're cursed to turn into animals, except one guy turns into a hawk during the day, and the woman turns he into he a turns wolf in, at night or she something. She turns into a hawk, and he turns into a wolf Oh, oh right, because it's a lady hawk, right? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, it would be man hawk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> totally different movie. <laughs> exactly. Um, the sword and the sorcerer. I I watched the trailer for it, and I, he has this sword with three blades, and the two, two of them shoot out. Um, and I kind oh, of yeah. remember that. I remember that, and then I they just like reappear, right? I, I I don't remember. I just I don't remember. <laughs> like they're they're like magically back later, and he can shoot them out again. They don't. Oh God. Very phallic. <laughs> well, there was well, a lot the of phallic by stuff. The way, in the 80s. By the yeah. way. Talk about very phallic. I, I have to say one more comment about uh, about Highlander. What was the? There's something going on in the subtext there that makes me, frankly, a little bit nervous. Where like number one, it, the whole when they meet, it's called the quickening. Yeah. And then when he cuts some, when somebody cuts somebody else's head off, they have this like special effects explosion gasm right after. <laughs> and I was I was like, is this like a a thinly veiled like serial killer cuz when you read books about serial killers, they always get like sexually aroused by killing people. So I was like, what? This makes me a little bit nervous like, but I'll try not to think about it metaphorically and just enjoy the movie. <laughs> Don't well, also, also when you get when you get ultimate power, the first thing you do is put on a nice sweater and go mm. to the countryside. Yeah, well, that's what I do. Well, I that was that do. is my one my one beef with the movie is that the prize is just like, wait, that's it? Like you <laughs> you can help people all over the world, like to communicate? Yeah. Like what the hell is that? Like it just oh, it was just like there was like a, Any... that was like a real letdown. I was well, like, no, I was he gets to grow old and die there. and have a family and fall in love. Like that was, you know, that was pretty big for him. Cause, and it was cool. It was a cool prize because you're like, oh, I can already do that. I'm like, awesome. This <laughs> makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> right. No, I'm well, just like everyone else, except I can read everyone's minds. Great. Well, when, when you're talking <laughs> about that kind of that. sexual imagery, Tom, I mean, this, it reminds me, I mean, I thought that there was a huge gay subtext going on in Masters of the Universe. And I don't remember what the lines were exactly, but like Skel the way that Skeletor talked about He Man, he would say stuff like, It's like it's always been you and me, like you can't live without me, like it was like <laughs> I remember I just remember turning to my girlfriend and being like, you know, You know there's so some slash fiction just. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Especially, you know, since he's mostly naked and oiled up. Right, well there's that. <laughs> I mean like, don't kill him, I just and... want to humiliate him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that yep. Oh, and and there's that scene where He Man's getting whipped with that like oh. uh, red whip. Where but <laughs> Evil Lynn, Evil thing. Lynn like smiles and she goes a little. And she's like, ooh. <laughs> I mean, do you think that? 
because this this like extremely muscular men wearing almost no clothing was such a trope of 80s fantasy yeah. do you think we're just we've moved past that and it'll never come back or or can you imagine like lots of movies with men dressed in like leather harnesses and nothing no. else what ever was the last movie that, 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 that's um, probably what maybe that's what the next he-man movie will be I think they just they please put them in more clothes because I I don't know maybe it's just me but at this point I'm just like oh just put a shirt on it's uncomfortable. Oh, I think what, I'm the what? only person who is I think I'm the only uh, middle aged woman who's just like oh put a put a shirt on <laughs> everybody else is just like what are you crazy I'm like no it's uncomfortable. Off topic a little bit so I'll make it short but the also about He Man the the musical the musical key that opens the gateway to the other dimensions and they have to have this special control mechanism for it but the kid. From from like you know Poughkeepsie Voyager. gets to save the day yeah. because he because he 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 has like a photo eidetic memory an eidetic memory for music or whatever which that's perfect wrong, pitch but, yeah but yeah. he has perfect pitch so he can remember and I'm like but it's six notes it's six <laughs> notes long like it's not that hard like and, anybody and the inventor is like I can remember it uh, <laughs> oh my you can remember he's like I don't know just music and once I hear it a couple <laughs> times I can just it just comes to me, and I'm like, wow, you're brilliant. Like, everybody can do that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh. But, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, the reason that we're talking about, like, like, these are, like, we're bad movies, except with the possible exception of Highlander, but they're all, we're saying they're awesomely bad, and they have a certain, like, what's the word? Like, like a fearlessness or, like, a vision or you know, grandiosity or something yeah. that, that makes them, you still remember them decades later. And um, yeah. And, and I, so I, I think it would be harder to make them today. Right. Because oh, yeah. you, you have all the, yeah. the studio execs going, that's not going to work. And we, you know, exactly. we need to, we need to do the, you know, the, the, the fifth sequel to this, you know, franchise. Yeah. And we, well, that's we a whole other issue with Hollywood yeah. is the sequelitis yeah. um, because nobody wants to invest real money in something new and untested. So they just keep, they buy a product, you know, Pro, uh, books to make them to movies. They they're making plays and musicals out of stuff that's already like nobody wants to risk money. It's it's a risk averse business at this point, which is why we're getting all these sequels and reboots. Um, and also, what was the movie that they made a few years ago? The John John something of Mars. The uh, yeah John, John Carter, Carter of Mars. Mars. John Carter of Mars. Um, that movie flopped big time, and that was kind of like a mostly naked oiled up guy yeah. running around yeah, um, yeah absolutely. and that yeah, that so, died horribly and and yeah. well deservedly should have died yeah but... so fearlessness is a great way to describe it dave because back then i remember reading something about how back in the 80s and 90s it was like hollywood would just throw around million dollar yep. advances like nothing and, and it's yep. not like that today whereas back then yeah, you could be fearless. You could be like, hey, what about a movie like this? And some exec would be like, yeah, okay, let's try it. Why well, the not? first Terminator film, I mean, the first Terminator film, you know, is kind of, I mean, it has like a B-movie sensibility. It's just like, yeah, yeah let's just do this action film and they'll call, they'll travel through time. And they'll be like this guy trying to kill them and, and she's, you know, her son is the savior of everyone. And yeah. like, that's just kind of, you know, the, this, they're just like, throw it at the wall, see what sticks. And some but of them do. All of those movies back then also had that B movie sensibility. Star Wars does, yeah. Indiana Jones does. Those are all all those movies were in, the, the you know uh, Spielberg and Lucas were all influenced by the mo B movies they watched growing up as children. Yeah, um, and so pulp fiction. I mean, they were total pulp fiction stories. Total pulp exactly, fiction. Yeah. But now they've become like classic films um, because of the visions of these classic talented filmmakers. So you can take that B movie tropes and make them great you just have to reinvent them and i think you a can. lot the movies that we're looking we're talking about now took the tropes didn't reinvent them you know but yeah yeah and i think what 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 was going right with those non-bad movies is that they were like uh they were just like hitting all these problems and just rolling forward and and yeah. pulling in a lot of good people like I, i've read I've watched documentaries on, um, you know, the making of Aliens and The Thing and the the stuff that they came up against and even Jaws, like they would come up against these problems like, oh, the shark looks fake or the alien monster looks fake or or, um, you know, we don't we don't know how to make this thing that's supposed to wrap around these people's faces. And they would just hire good people and be like, can you try to solve this problem? And then yeah. they'd come back or they, you know, the, the spaceship looks dumb and alien. So so Ridley Scott's like, well, I'm going to. 
I'm just going to show the spaceship, but I'm going to put it on a fuzzy TV screen with a lot of fog in front of it because it looks really stupid. And so he would do that. And then like suddenly it makes it so much more eerie because you're like, I can't actually see the spaceship. It's night. There's only like, you know, like lightning flashes or whatever. And then there's all this static in the way. But that makes it so much yeah. creepier. It creates um, atmosphere as, as opposed to giving into the limitations. Sometimes the best, most creative you can get is when you have to deal with the limitations that you're dealt with. You know? Right. Whereas now we don't have limitations. We have CGI. Yes. And you, yeah, just make it. it. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's one of the big strengths of these movies. I thought is the locations were amazing, and I feel like yeah. because they couldn't do any CGI or anything, they actually went, took the trouble to go to amazing locations and shoot yeah. actual amazing vistas. And that's... yeah, I was wondering where they shot Krull because it was amazing. It looked the, yeah. wherever they shot it was. Uh, I don't know where it was, but it was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It was also making me kind of sad, like, with all these movies, thinking how many sword and sorcery movies there used to be. And granted, they were all pretty bad. I mean, I don't think there were really any legitimately good epic fantasy slash sword and sorcery movies before Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring. I think that was the first one that you could recommend to someone who doesn't like fantasy, and they would be like, oh, yeah, it's a good movie. Um, But um, I was just looking over just, like, the top 100 on iTunes movies right now, and there's, like, basically no epic fantasy sword and sorcery movies on it i mean maybe a handful but uh i just think that's kind of sad that um you know i mean maybe i mean you got like game of thrones on tv and stuff but that's well lord of the rings and game of thrones are the really the only ones that have been made for i i think the problem is and i think we've touched on it before is that people make have been in the past making those movies for children you know just coming up as a, as a nerd as a kid i was reading tolkien i was reading George R. R. Martin, and I would get made fun of. I was the only nerd in my, you know, my all Catholic school, so it, it was it was a tough road to hoe. Um, but um, you know, and and they would make fun of me. Oh, like what are you reading that kid stuff for? And now suddenly everybody's like, oh, I love, I know everything about Game of Thrones, and I'm like, look, motherfuckers, I was yeah. doing this for twenty, I've been back. doing this for thirty freaking years, and now now you're cool. Screw you. Yeah, exactly. It's annoying. So uh, you exactly. know, I think it's finally been made a legitimate storytelling genre. It's finally legitimate, and and going forward, hopefully we get more. That's not bunch of naked oiled up guys you know <laughs> throwing swords around well actually speak um, but actually it, that actually speaks to story as opposed to um idiot tropes actually speaking of game of thrones i was getting a couple like flashes game of thrones flashes watching some of these movies because you know like i said telepathic control of animals comes up yeah in these movies and that's obviously something that happens in game of thrones and then there was the kid in um was it crawl there's like the seer dressed in green, and then he has his little kid little dressed boy, in green, yeah. who's also a seer. And this is like really made me think of Jojen Reed, the, yeah. like the the idea of the green seer. And so I, I don't know. I just I feel like I'm sure George R. R. Martin is familiar with all these movies Absolutely. and is sort of raising it to high, taking this material, this sort of kind of like we were saying, pulpy kind of material, and raising it to high art. Right. Well, it's yeah. like that that Tolkien uh, quote about the uh, the leaf mold in your mind. That's from Gene uh, Cavellas in in Odyssey. The, you know, you take all these ideas and it, it, you stick it in the leaf mold of your mind and then it comes out later as like mm, the same idea, but, <laughs> but, but new, you know, it grows yeah. in a different way in your head as a writer. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. That was my insightful thing to say for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also just mention, so, um, on Facebook, Gavin, one of our listeners, Gavin McMenemy said that Beastmaster is based on a, Andre Norton novel, I think very loosely based, but he says it was originally a space Western about a a Native American. (laughs) So (laughs) I guess they changed it a lot. Uh, But um, yeah, I I never knew that. Um, So it's kind of interesting. All right. So we are pretty much out of time. So um, how about some some final thoughts? Any other final thoughts? So how about uh, Matt? Final thoughts? Um, Go watch bad 80s movies uh some of them are horrendous and some of them like you'll find little gems in them i think um and it was it was really fun to just go back and revisit this stuff and and you know be 12 years old again and yeah and and i think um you know looking at these films that uh like we were saying haven't been made with you know all this extensive cgi and just how they were able to solve certain problems using you know uh classic filmmaking techniques you know, it, it's eye opening and, and, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, 
not everything is terrible. Um, like we said, Highlander. I I think that like the scenes in Crawl. I mean, yes, it's sort of plot coupon going from one <laughs> thing to the next, but there's also some incredible creativity there. And I and I think that um, looking back at these films, uh, the biggest thing I took out of them was just just the amount of of creativity that these uh, filmmakers had. So. Yeah, I, I want to talk about the science fiction films now. Yep, <laughs> yep, that's the next one. Yeah. I'm there for that. <laughs> uh, so, Andrew, any other final thoughts? No, I, I agree with Matt. It's just go back and watch them. It is just, especially if you grew up watching them, it was, for me, becoming a teenager again. It's incredible fun. Yeah, it's some bad movies, um, but there is a lot a lot of fun to be had in terrible movies. Um it, it, if you don't take it seriously and you get you get to sit there and you get to laugh and you get to look at the past and you get to see how far we've come um in filmmaking um and uh it, it's just about having fun and that's what that's what bad 80s science, fantasy movies is about hmm. fun and also highlander is a great movie <laughs> end of story uh, tom final thought yeah, I I say uh, be thankful for what you have today. I I think uh, <laughs> it, it, things have come. The bar has raised to an incredible. It, it's fun to be fifty years old and see how high the bar has been raised. I mean, there's some great storytelling out there right now. There's some fantastic movies, literally and figuratively both. I've I've been sitting here the whole time. I've been talking, looking at my boyhood home, which I live about a thousand miles away from now. But um, it's it's eerie it's bizarre it's it's been reclaimed by the forest there's the lawn is all unkempt and it looks like an old gothic ruin now um it's it's uh re- you know shows me how far we've come in 50 years from from or even in in 30 years 40 years since most of these movies came out um and uh just it's just kind of creepy for me to look at this old residence and think how i used to watch a lot of these movies in that house how long ago that was, how far everything's come, and how we've got all these great Marvel and other movies out one after the other after the other. And lo- and not just in the theater either. You know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and all these other production houses are coming out with these fantastic movies one after the other. you get got so much great content today. Don't take it for granted. Um, you can go back and watch these ones if you want in a historical sense. They're good, but there's so much better stuff today. So that's my angle on it. And if people are confused, the reason Tom is staring at this house is because he's sitting in his car recording this panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, I uh, hope everyone enjoyed that. And definitely keep an eye out for our awesomely bad 80s science fiction movies, which will uh, hopefully be sometime soon. But we are all out of time, so I'm going to wrap things up there. So, we've been speaking with Andrea Kale, Tom Grenzer, and Matthew Kressel. So, thanks, to everyone, so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Andrea Kale, Tom Gerenser, and Matthew Kressel for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Alice Phelan, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution... You can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.